was so glad to walk in here and I hear uh, worship. Um, just the, you know, and uh, we know the word says the Father is looking for worshippers in spirit and truth. Um, and I, 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 I want to share quickly just before I start the, the word, uh, because it's important, you know, when you engage with people, you need to get fresh manner from the Lord. The Lord has a message, but there's a specific word for a specific time. And that's very important. Um, so when I walked in here and I sensed this atmosphere of worship, um, I suddenly realized, li uh, linking up with the scripture the Lord gave me, you know, worship is extremely powerful. And I just want to speak for a moment about that. Sometimes we, we, have, we think it should happen in the church. Um, worship is meant for the church, and when we go to church, we worship. Your business is meant for worship. The atmosphere in your business is um, shaped by worship. You know when the Lord um, took the Israelites into the promised land? He changed the plans um, from rational to irrational. They were preparing the, for battle in the desert. And here they come and they need to walk around the walls. And <laughs> the Lord says, put the worshippers in front, you know. A completely irrational battle strategy, but it worked perfectly. The moment they followed their own ideas with the next city, it failed. And they went back and said, Lord, speak to us. Worship is a form of governance. It's spiritual governance. Worship sets the atmosphere. And let me tell you, worship is not playing a Christian CD in the background. No, no. Worship needs to be intentional. Then it's worship. It's good for a basic atmosphere, you know, um, something like that. Because some businesses do play Christian music, you know, in the background. But worship sets a tone. Your business, your environment, your home, your business should be an altar of worship. Remember last night, we spoke about um, a priesthood stepping up and influencing society. What is a priest? A priest functions at an altar. The word talks about a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of worship. So it's a sacrifice you bring unto the Lord. But that sacrifice needs to come from a place of purity. The Lord, the Father says, I'm seeking those who worship me in spirit and truth. So don't think worship is just another thing. Similar to prayer, just something you do. No, no. People, worship. You govern a part of a city through worship. In Bloemfontein, we've done this. We've started it. Um, for Since 2010, every quarter, we have what we call a rooftop praise and worship. On top of Mimosa Mall, We've got an event where we worship. Churches come together, Christians from all over Bloemfontein. The next one is the, second, uh, the first of uh, November. Um, on top of a shopping mall, in the marketplace, because we tend to worship more at church or where, where we are received. In the marketplace where we set the tone, and, and at some point one friend of mine who was in the inner circle of Satanism, in Bloemfontein, he got converted, set free, delivered, amazing. Uh, Peter is his name. He he's a student. He's doing his master's in chemistry. When he got there the first time, he said he's so glad to see the Christians are taking the high places. Because that's where they used to go. On top of the highest places and set curses on everybody. You see, an ungodly priesthood operates in the absence of a godly priesthood. But when a godly priesthood steps in, you change the atmosphere. And this is it. That's what we are called to do. So, so see your function in the marketplace. Not just doing business. Not just one-on-one. -on -one. You need to bring in God's atmosphere through various ways. Into the business, into your environment, into your street, wherever you go. You need to bring in God's atmosphere through God's ways. Worship, prayer, spreading the good news, and bringing people into God's presence. Because it's God's presence that makes the change. So here's the scripture, and it links up to what I said. Um, Psalm 44, 
for today. Um, it starts with, uh, okay, let's, let's read the whole, um, verse 1, Psalm 44. Um, it says, we have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. The nations you drove out, but these people you planted. Where your business is, where you serve God, God plants you. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession, God's people. They did not gain possession of the land by their own sword. Nor did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance. You see, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, the Lord says. You see, if, if Israel conquered um, Jericho and the other cities in a normal way, like winning a battle, nobody would have given God the glory. The nations would not have. They would just say it's a good strategy. But when it becomes irrational, out of the ordinary, different, walking around, what is this? Um, you see it is by God's arm. And nobody can take the glory. No man. Because you favored them. You see, there's a favor on God's people. And that links up with what I said last night about carrying the anointing. Carrying the favor of God. It's what you carry that makes a difference. Whatever the circumstance, what, it's what you carry. The stronger the anointing of God on you, the better. And just, um, guys, uh, people remember... Um, we, we said the challenge is we operate in silos. We have church and we have work, but we can't bring it together. When you bring worship into your business context, for instance, um, or an atmosphere of worship, you start bringing in God's reality into your business. And that's what we are called to do. Now, it sounds strange, you know, and the, you need to pray about how to do this. The Spirit will lead you. Um, maybe starting every morning with a, with a worship, you know, or doing something at some point in the day, worshiping together. Um, but that, that, that sets a different tone. It says further, verse 4, You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we will push down our enemies. You see, the kingdom is confrontational. And we know our battle is not against flesh and blood against spiritual forces. When you worship, you push down the enemy. When you worship God in spirit and truth, you, 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 you take authority over demonic activity. Any legal right the enemy has, you start taking authority. Um, through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against you, against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me, but you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. All day long. David had the custom of worshipping God seven times a day. I think it's Psalm 119 where it says, I worship you seven times a day. Specific, you see, there's an intentionality. Anything in the spiritual realm, whether evil or good, has only impact when there's intentionality. When you pray, like just this, just a little prayer, like a, when you start eating or whatever, just a, just a prayer, it has very little effect in the spiritual realm. When you pray with intentionality, with focus, it shifts things. Because faith kicks in. It's your faith that starts moving things. So when you have faith, it brings the intentionality. And then you become functioning as a ruling priesthood. The same with worship. Intentional. Um, when it comes from a place of purity, it's good. 
But that purity has a purpose, and God wants to use that worship for a purpose. You start making declarations over the business, over your city, um, over surroundings. You start flowing in the spirit. And that's what God means, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. It's not to say that His Spirit is, you know, not power and not might. No. The Holy Spirit is the, fi- the uh, descriptive word is dunamis. The highest power. No power like it. You see, that's what you invite into your business when you are intentional about it. Um, so, so may this word encourage you. Um, I think it's very significant to emphasize worship because... As I said, it's part of us separating uh, the spiritual and the physical. And the Lord wants us to to combine it. Um, Right, so let's... I was asked to talk about the book enough. Some of you have had it and had a look at it. Genoeg Afrikaans. Um, There's another box there um, if you are interested. Uh, and, And just in terms of the message. Now this book... Uh, maybe just to give some background, I started writing it um, when I was lecturing in Austria. Every year um, I'm invited to lecture in Salzburg at the university there. don't know if there are German-speaking people here, um, but Fachhochschule University in Salzburg. And uh, it's also my time to just spend time with the Lord, to separate myself, because you don't know many people there. And just So I lecture during the day. It's a master's course. Uh, it's for three weeks, very intense. I see them every day. They write exam at the end, you know, so, um, and I have to mark before I come back. But the afternoons, five o'clock, it's done, and then I've got time. I walk into the forests and spend time with the Lord and so on. One day I was standing there in 2014 um, in the forest, and there are these massive tall trees. I don't know if you've been, it's just different. Those trees are massive, um, straight like poles. Um, and the Lord said to me, Arno, you are standing amongst my arrows. And I wondered, okay, Lord, what do you mean? And I knew it was prophetic speech. Um, and the Lord said, I'm calling you to go back to South Africa and to make what is crooked straight again. Because I want to shoot my arrows from my rainbow nation. So there's a couple of things. The Lord emphasized rainbow nation. Why rainbow nation? Well, we are known as a rainbow nation. But there's a political connotation to rainbow nation and racial and all of this. Um, The rainbow is God's first promise to mankind. You know that in Genesis? Here we have a nation in the end times. Now we don't know when the Lord will come, but we all sense it's the end times. A nation in the end times called the rainbow nation. A nation of God's first promise. Something the Lord wants to do in South Africa that will speak to the nations. And these trees represent arrows that he wants to shoot. God wants to pull what is crooked straight. The crookedness is part of people losing hope, losing faith, losing courage, and also people that compromise. Compromise the word. Compromise the truth. That start bending over to the enemy's side, not realizing it being conditioned by society to think and accept certain things as if that's the way things are. To pull it straight again. What is straight? Alignment with God's word. Alignment with his will. So, so I knew the, the Lord, uh, there's something here. Um, and the Lord gave me the scripture, um, I, Habakkuk 2 verse 2, which says, write the vision. Make it plain. Let people read it as they run by People, as that scripture came up, it was like a a fountain that burst open on my inside. And words started to come. Suddenly the Lord showed me visions about South Africa. Current and forward, future. 
suddenly certain things um, started to well up on my inside regarding South Africa. So I knew I need to write down, write the vision. And uh, also when I stood there, I realized sometimes we are too close to see. We are so in this situation, we need to step a bit back and understand what's happening. Because it's in our face too much, in the newspapers, on the TV, all this turmoil. And we don't know, we are disorientated. What's going on? Where are we going? What's the sources of all these instability? How do we fix it? You know, all these questions that we don't have immediate answers for. It's necessary to be separated unto the Lord, to get perspective, to go up the mountain and see from God's perspective. And that's what happened to me um, at that point. People, I started to just write down. I went to my room, just got out and started to write down. I think until 3 o'clock that morning, it just, it flowed. And then I knew the Lord is onto something. Um, it continued. Um, and when I came back to South Africa, the Lord said, I'm going to show you specific things to do research about. And it was amazing sources and things that came across my path. Now, um, the book is essentially a wake-up call to South Africa. The title, Enough, because enough is enough. Things cannot go on like this. Um, and it's not just for South Africa. It's, the focus is South Africa, but it's a word to the nations. Um, to start questioning um, the system we are operating in. And it's not from a rebellious point of view, but to say, how is this system aligned with God's word? And if it's not aligned with, our God, with God's word, what are we to do to bring the necessary change? But we have to understand. Now there's a scripture in, um, in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 12 verse 32 which talks about the sons of Issachar. They had an understanding of the times, it says, and they knew what Israel was supposed to do. You won't know what to do if you don't understand the times. And it's not just Matthew 24 where Jesus says the birthing pains, okay, we know it's the end times. No, no, no. What's the nature of this? What's the essence of this? What is, if, if our society is being poisoned, what is causing the poison? You see, you have to unmask the devil, if I can put it like that, to get some honesty and get clarity what's going on. So this book, to a large extent, is about investigating what is the sources of this. I mean, we live in a world where, where, where what is wrong is now right. And what is right is wrong. It's turned around. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, it says, a woe to those who call evil good and evil uh, good evil, who call darkness light and light darkness, who call bitter sweet and sweet bitter, who change it around. We live in a society 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have imagined the things are now that are now fully acceptable in society. How do we get here? There's a scripture, and I quickly want to read it in Isaiah, um, that basically explains this. Isaiah 59 verse 14. It says, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth falls, and who, he who departs from the truth, so, so, he who departs from evil, makes himself a prey. Those who want to do the right thing, you become the prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. <coughs> Why is not somebody standing in the gap? Why, isn't, why is f truth fallen in the street and nobody's doing anything about it? And that realization is what birthed the book. That why don't we see a stand? Why don't we see a line in the sand being drawn and saying enough is enough? We've had enough of the system. Why not? Two reasons. 
people accept too easily. They accept, they are conditioned, they, 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 they are convinced it's part of what must happen. This is, you know. And number two, the church is unprepared to deal with the realities that the world is throwing at us. Unprepared. We are not equipped. And it's not to just go against the pastors and church system. No, no, no. We embrace the church fully. We are the church. But we realize that we need to become more equipped in dealing with addressing the, uh, the poison in the society. The things that, that, are, that are contaminating. Now, um, in my book, I've done a bit of an investigation into this. Um, there is, uh, let me say this, um, I, the Lord showed me clearly, one day I was in the library at the university, I was actually looking for certain books for my own economic research, and uh, the Lord said, walk down this aisle, then down that aisle, I walked, and he said, stop, look in front of you. And I saw there's a book there, um, a blue book that stood out. Um, the title was strange, um, it was the externalization of the hierarchy. And the author was Alice Bailey. And, and the name ring the bell. And the Lord said, take it out. I went, I googled quickly, and I saw she's the mother of the new age. Alice Bailey. You can, you can actually get the whole book on PDF. People, that book, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, was published in 1958. And it is the blueprint for how to change society from a Christian foundation to a secular foundation. The whole strategy is laid out. And she says, this book it was inspired by a master, spiritual master that appeared to me. She gives the name Dwal Ku. And uh, now we know as Christians that um, that is demonic. It's a typical familiar spirit that appears. He said to her, write down. So that whole plan is demonically inspired. And the detail of that you wouldn't imagine. If you can have a look at it, um, please do with great discernment and as the Holy Spirit leads. Now, it's not, it's very, <laughs> it's written in a way that you wouldn't quickly see this is evil. It's almost the goodness of mankind. But the basic essence of it is to highlight man as God and to make God nothing in society. To make the word of God count for nothing. To make it just one more opinion. To prepare humanity to shape, it's like social engineering, to shape a consciousness that are focused on man-centeredness. Humanism, essentially, especially modern day humanism, um, is a product of what she wrote. Now, interesting, just to say this as well, and I emphasize it in the book, she pointed out right there a date where the fullness of what is being planned will kick in. And that date, the book was published in 1958, and she died the year after, or close in that, in that time. Um, the date she throw, threw out was the year 2025. Nine years from now. This is why we see this intensification. Why certain agendas are being pushed. Why suddenly morality in society is fracturing completely. Why you have these protests. Why there's the, the, the Bible is seen as just another opinion. Not the word of God. There's a sudden shift. And it intensified especially since the 2000s. And we see this in South Africa. In South Africa's context, I mean, it's a global thing. Uh, we've just talked about uh, the American context. There they are at the right in front. But in South Africa, this seeped in in 1994, where um, the policies and the laws were changed to, to accommodate all these worldly popular mindsets. Now, we all know apartheid is from the devil. And it is not God's will. Nobody today can justify the apartheid, especially not with the Bible. Um, but the thing is, the church went silent in 94 as well. 
the white church felt guilty about apartheid, so the white church pulled back, if I can put it, put it like that. Sorry for the description. The black church was excited, something new, rising up, but there was also not the stand for truth that there should have been. I mean, if you look at pornography, a lot of the laws, I, I highlighted in the book, um, the, the, the homosexual marriage that was um, um, affirmed, the death penalty taken away, a lot of this. Steve um, have a whole list of, of all these changes, and they keep coming. I mean, now, on the table in Parliament, um, and it's probably soon, is the issue of hate speech, where you won't be able to preach against certain things in public, not in church or anywhere else. In Finland, they took pastors from the pulpit because they called certain things a sin. You see, the church is at a very critical point. The word says in Timothy that the church is the pillar and the foundation of truth. If the church don't stand for truth, we have nothing. Society falls apart. So, the thing is, I want to quickly read this to you. This is part of the plan she, she drew up. A, a so-called 10-point plan. Um, and it's observable from a number of, of, of what she wrote. Um, number one, remove God and pray from the education system. Number two, remove the authority parents have over their children. Number three, Terminate the Judeo-Christian family or the traditional Christian family structure. Number four, if there is sex sexual freedom, then make abortion legal. Number five, make divorce easy and legal. Free people from the idea of lifelong marriages. Number six, encourage homosexuality as an alternative lifestyle. Number seven, debase the arts. Set it free. Let it become wild. Number eight, use the media to promote new and different ways of thinking. Number nine, create a global interfaith movement. With other words, religious equality. And let, number ten, let authorities take it up in their laws and get the church to approve it all. Now this is interesting. So the first thing is question the word. And that's the battering ram to get the door open, to weaken the influence of the church, to spread doubt within the church, God's people, among God's people. And then number two, the second part of the agenda is religious equality. Now remember, it sounds fair, but it is from the pit of hell. Religious freedom, we don't have a problem with. I can't force a Muslim to become a Christian, and a Muslim can't force me to become a Muslim. Okay? Fair. That's fine. Um, although I don't agree, I have to respect in terms of tolerance. You all with me? So, so we, we are happy with religious freedom, and in fact, we promote it as well. The government shouldn't come to me and tell me you can't preach about this. There is an infringement on religious freedom. Okay? But religious equality is something different. It means all religions are the same. It means that there is no just one way to God. This thing about Jesus being the way, the life, and the truth is nonsense. There are many ways to God. Now, it sounds not so threatening, but you know what? It rips out the heart of the gospel. The power of the gospel, Romans 1.16, is ripped out. Why? Because suddenly Jesus is not the savior of the world. Suddenly we don't have a gospel to preach. Suddenly we just, what we talk about is, yes, he died for our sins, but it's now for us as Christians, it's good news. Why did Jesus send out people all over the world to spread the good news? You see, that is the main purpose, to prepare the world for another world savior. That's what this sets up. So it relativizes truth. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. There is no standard of truth, the word of God. And there is no official savior. You see, and we need to see through this. 
it sounds, okay, what does this have to do with business and our functioning or whatever? People, it has everything to do with it. Because these are the things, we as the church, and this is what I tried to emphasize so strongly last night. We must see ourselves, when I set up a business, it becomes, I am the church. That becomes a place where the church functions. And this is a critical thing because we tend to separate and we think, no, that's a spiritual matter and it won't affect the... It shapes society because everything is spiritual. Everything has a spiritual impact, whether positive or negative, evil or good. So, 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 so by, by opening up and exposing this agenda, it leads us to the point where we st need to understand um, how we need to make a stand in society for God's truth. Um, and, and this is it. The book is a message of hope, sobering word, but a message of hope, to, to tell people that, listen, we've got a window of opportunity. If we don't do it, especially in South Africa, if we're not going to use it, if we're not going to make a stand for God's word and impact society with that standard, we are losing this country. And that's, that you can apply all around the world. Europe, everything works well. The trains are on time, there's neat, everything. But they are godless, if I can put it like that. When you talk to the young people, they don't know the name Jesus. Um, four or five people are sitting in churches. And they, old people are in these cathedrals. People, that, there's a, it's completely secular. You see, the answer is not better governance and let's fix the problems. The answer is people need to get to Jesus. They need to get a renewed emphasis in the hearts of God's people to lead people to Jesus. Because no change will last unless Jesus is part of that change. And like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for us in South Africa, we will align ourselves with God's word. Like David when he said to Goliath, this day the world will see there's a God in Israel. This day the, Lord will, the world will see there's a God in South Africa. In Africa. People, Africa is a very important, last night I talked about the minerals and all, you know, God has a set purpose for Africa in the end times. The godly pattern has always been, biblically, um, those which the world despise, the Lord use, the Lord elevate them. If you go to the rest of the world, they ask you the question, are you surviving in Africa? Are you okay there? You? They look down on Africa. They don't expect much. But this is what God will use. The Africa, the heart of Africa. Africa is made to worship the living God. And we have so much to learn from each other. Black and white need each other. And this is what God will use in the end time. The time is coming. We need to sense this. And we need to sense our role and our purpose in this. The book is a call up to say sense what God wants to do in the end times. I'm going to close with this. Um, we know what the Bible said prophetically. What is, what is uh, determined will happen. Okay? We know what's happening. It's the spirit of the Antichrist is rising. But the Holy Spirit is raising up the church. Because Jesus comes back for a glorious church. Not a weak church. Not a church that's you know, full of sin. There's a, there, there will be an emphasis on the word. Holiness and being on fire for God through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, the battle is the Lord's. But He always used us. Because we are the priesthood. We have been given the authority on this earth. He said, subdue the earth. The devil stole that. Jesus came and he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now I give it to you. You see, we must take up that authority in all humility and start becoming agents of God's kingdom and infiltrate society and understand the purpose of each country and the destiny and plans God have it. Be an arrow that God wants to shoot in South Africa because for him to shoot something from South Africa, something very significant needs to change here. 
And I believe this desperation that's setting into the country is setting the scene. God is setting the table in front of the enemies. He's preparing a table for us. We need to be ready to seize the opportunity. If we're going to keep on being asleep, wait, you know, uh, evil flourishes when good people do nothing. We know what's wrong, but we do nothing. We wait on each other and nothing happens. It's time to step up. May the Holy Spirit show you exactly what your fight is. Your part of the wall you need to rebuild. Let the Holy Spirit show you exactly. And this is it. It's a call to action. We can